Aloha. Happy New Year, 2023. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is The IRS Fails to Audit Trump's Tax Returns. Uh, we're going to actually cover two topics today. That being one is the IRS failure to audit President Trump's tax returns for several years. And the other one is um, to discuss the, the arrival of um, representative-elect George Santos and uh, from New York and, and what that entails and the horrific stories that he's been telling, a, a tale of yarn, as an old term is, a tale of lies, and the impact of those lies to not only the voters who put him in office, but certainly to the leadership of the Republican Party. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my guests, Jay Fidel, my co-host, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair, our contributor. Good morning. Morning, Tim. Morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It is going to be a happy New Year. I hope. I don't know what makes you say that, but you go right ahead. Yes, I you know, I live in my own world, Jay, and and I'm welcome to it. Thank you. Uh Jay, since you uh, opened things up here with that little comment, let's go to you on uh you know, Trump's tax returns. Um they weren't audited by the IRS, although there was a mandatory requirement to do so. And it didn't happen until the Democrats took over the House back in 2018, uh, specifically the Ways and Means Committee. And the audits weren't brought to the intention of the IRS until um, uh, Neil Richards, Democrat from Maine, said, hey, as you like to say, que pasa? Well, que pasa about these audits? What's going on? So, Jay, I'm curious. What's your, what's your theory as to why the IRS blatantly ignored uh, conducting an audit, which they've done for every president prior to this. Um, I'm reminded of Comey, Comey's rule and the book and the movie by James Comey of the uh, FBI, uh, where he gave us uh, great detail about how try, Trump tried to corrupt him, I invited him to a dinner, you know, in the White House, just the two of them. And he said to Comey, you like your job? Comey says, yes. And says, well, you want to keep your job, you have to be loyal to me. That was the essence of the dinner. So we know that he tried to, tried hard, by the way, to corrupt the FBI. Ultimately, he fired Comey, and he, and he fired McCabe as number two, and he tried to corrupt the FBI. We know he um, took great steps to uh, corrupt, um, you know, the Department of Justice uh, and the uh, United States attorneys in various districts. Um, you know, he put his uh, judges all over the country, and that was a kind of its own corruption. Um, we know he he brought his people into the Department of Homeland Security, and so on. I could I could go on. Uh, it, the whole cabinet was, a, a, you know, a corruption, and the people, of course, around him, around the Oval Office, they were a corruption. So why not the IRS too? Most recently, we heard about the Secret Service. And, well, uh, yeah, was, I was just wanted to talk about, corruption. remember uh, DeJoy of the U.S. Postal Service? Yeah. Um, we had James Murray of the Secret Service, and we certainly had uh, indications from Homeland Security that the agency heads or directors weren't really following their agency's uh, mission or duties, and yeah, in so some cases, blatantly not following them. And the question is, Jay, is this out of loyalty to Trump uh, or his instructions to not follow their duty? Well, both. Both. Yeah. I mean, he corrupted the government. That was, you know, that but was how do his we... essential mission. And you say, well, OK, until now, we didn't know that he corrupted the Internal Revenue Service. But I think it's clear that he did. I um, mean, this was the policy. He had promised the country he was going to turn over his tax returns. There was plenty of press about it, uh, but he didn't. And they didn't audit him, even though he said they had been auditing him. And so what do you have here? You know, you have a, um, a left-right combination, which, you know, ultimately settles out at the fact that he had stopped the Internal Revenue Service from auditing him. And, and it just, I mean, to me, I guess we should have realized early on that no government agency was exempt from his attempts to corrupt everything. Um, but this is, again, you know, confirmation that he did, including, and, and it's, it's kind of a surprise about the IRS because you think the IRS kind of like walks on water. They're very independent, you know, they're very Elliot Ness in their style of, you know, of management and relating to the, the government as it exists. 
but no, he somehow reached them. We don't know the whole story yet. Unfortunately, we're not going to find out the whole story anytime soon. But I well, think and, we and why is that? What? I mean, we okay. So we have a you know quite a bit of circumstantial evidence, but we don't have any you know hard fact evidence. And, and so the question is, will we ever find out? Number one, and two. What are the consequences to these agency directors that just followed what seemingly says or to be Donald Trump's marching orders? What are the consequences? And, and why isn't Joe Biden, who's technically in charge of all these things uh, as president of the United States, why isn't there consequences being handed down? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. There should be. But remember, we, we have a, uh, a House of Representatives that is not only in disarray, but is um, the contemplating uh, terminating the uh, ethics uh, commission that that was established in the 90s um and that is going to make it m much easier for republicans to violate ethical rules it's going to make it much harder to investigate ethical violations um and you know I, although the uh, democrats had their had their chance to do um a what do you want to call it a, a, bi a bilateral type of uh, investigation uh, over January 6th, that, that ended last week, and it's not going to start up again. There won't be another committee or commission or select committee or anything like that that will go after you know this issue or other corruption issues, uh, as long as the Republicans are running things. Uh, and I use the term running very loosely. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think we're going to find out. All we can do is connect the dots. It is therefore incumbent on the media not to forget, you know, what the dots are saying to us, not to forget that this was reported. Now it has to be examined. We should expect more in the Times and the Post you know, and other, other uh, national um, newspapers. We should, Does we this should story get buried? It. Well, the Republicans want to bury it. Uh, certainly Trump wants to bury it. And you know what? Probably the IRS wants to bury it. It's going to be very embarrassing if the details come out. But I think there's a fair chance the details will say that he corrupted them. Okay. I, uh, Cynthia, what's your take on this? Uh, similar to Jay's or, or, or not? I think very similar to Jay's. I have sort of not trusted the IRS for quite a long time because of the way they've been so walking everything. They never came out with any news of audits or no audits or, or anything for that matter. So I personally don't even trust what was handed over. But that's just me. Because once these people are corrupted, how are we supposed to know how corrupt, right? Are mm -hmm. they able to get in there and change numbers and change things? And, and so I, I don't know as I, even as much damning evidence as there is in this, you know, whole release of these tax returns, for me, the foreign bank accounts that were undisclosed are the biggest uh, red flag for me as far as possible liability for for Trump, because there's been other cases, there's plenty of precedent set for people that don't disclose and what the punishments are. You know, I'd like to read something. Uh, and as much as I hate of repeating anything that Trump ever says, I think this is important. He says, the Democrats should never have done it. This is all in regard to releasing these six years into the public. Uh, the Democrats should never have done it. The Supreme Court should never have approved it. And it's going to lead to horrible things for so many people. Okay, so that's a threat. I mean, what horrible things? And which so many people? Well, what he said, what he said is that he was worried. Uh, I mean, I mean that in a, uh, in a sense, I, I say it. He was concerned that uh, this would mean that Biden would have to turn over his returns. But, yeah, but, but he was ill-informed. Biden has already turned over his returns. That's so right. Trump, and Trump again, no, and the problem is, I thought to myself, when I saw that, there's a lot of people in the country believe it. They believe that Joe Biden is going to have to turn over his returns and it's going to be embarrassing. And they don't know because Trump lied that, that Biden already turned his returns over. 
He, he already has said that. And the Republicans now aren't saying they're going to go after Joe okay. Biden. They're saying that they're going to go after a Hunter Biden. But this is the other part of what the quote that I was going to read is. The Trump tax returns once again show how proudly successful I have been and how I have been able to use depreciation and various other tax deductions as an incentive for creating thousands of jobs and magnificent structures of enterprise. All this holier than thou smokescreen that he's throwing up. Yet in these returns, we saw something that is apparently, according to quite a few tax experts, never, never happens. And that is the oh, the operating costs, just like, for example, his um, helicopter company, right? They claim the exact amount of uh, uh, overhead and cost as they as they made. So right, to the exact dollar and out, penny. To the exact penny, which is the thing that is so unusual and never happens. And oh, it's okay. So fun. There was four that that claimed the same thing. Okay, so you know many Americans overestimate their expenses, and if they're caught, they're audited, and they pay their penalty and their fee. End of story. Happens all the time to millions of Americans that are quite generous with their expenses with their schedule Schedule E or Schedule C. Uh, so what? Where is this a nothing burger about Donald Trump's taxes that have been? In the news, and we've been fighting about it, and went all the way to the Supreme Court after many, many six years, six plus years. And what are we going to ultimately find out that is all that damning? Or um, I'll put it the way Trump did: you can't learn much from my tax returns, but it is illegal to release them if they're not yours. Uh, so, what do we learn from this, Cynthia? Well, I think we learn about the foreign bank accounts for one. I think we also learn a little bit more about the IRS because how trustworthy are they? As Jay was saying before, how corrupt are they? Um, how much can we actually trust what was released to the Ways and, and Means Committee? So those things I think are important. Some of the, the things that he overestimated or obviously estimated perfectly to match up to the penny those things he does have to pay for when he's audited, but there's not been an audit since they never completed the one. So they didn't do one for two years. Then the one that they did start after the Democrats required it never even got finished. It just stopped being done. So mm -hmm. that says a lot. It also says something to me anyway about the Supreme Court and so we know that the Supreme Court basically backs everything Trump does. So because there's their majority. Oh, wait a minute. They just they just released. They just made a decision to release the return. Well, that's where I'm going with this. OK, go. Yeah. That shows me that we can't trust what they are, because if they were trying to protect Trump like they always do, they would have declined the, the release of them. So how um, convenient is it for Trump? to get re tax returns released that don't really show anything that's that bad. It actually is in his favor. So that's where I go, wait a minute. I think you're so, going way, way out there on this one. Well, I think, that, you know, I I mean, think they decided that thinking. as a matter of law. I don't think that was uh, intended hey, to help Jay, him. Jay, from, from day one, was this a Donald Trump classic silver distraction, a silver object distraction? Well, yeah, I think he, he uh, you know, as part of his um, M.O., um, he said, he, you know, they asked for it way back when, uh, even when he was running. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll turn it over. But, you know, I'm being audited. He wasn't being audited. He lied. Um, and then he obfuscated and delayed for years. And as I recall, Cynthia, there was what, what the IRS did. And I'm not saying the IRS is corrupt. I'm saying, as so many other agencies, Trump corrupted it on, on a given issue. And, and and this one it sure it sure looks like that's what happened. Uh, I think they assigned one auditor, just one, uh, to audit all these returns, and there were many of them. They were as complex as you get. 
Um, and, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was hard. It was impossible for him to actually order it, so he never could finish. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that, uh, you know, what we, what we have here is that Trump's returns are not consistent with his statements of wealth and success. They are rather a statement of loss and mismanagement over a long period of time. And I, I don't think we can forget that because he was telling us, he was lying to us about just how wonderfully successful he was when he wasn't. And the returns demonstrate that. Now, as to the valuations and the returns, we, we you really don't have an answer on that yet. But remember, in New York State, there's uh, litigation pending about um, undervaluation, overvaluation. Uh, the whole Michael Cohn thing, where he revealed that to Congress, that Trump regularly misevaluated intentionally, willfully, by multiples. Okay, you can say, uh, Tim, that uh, you know there are people in this country that really don't follow exactly what they're supposed to do uh, in reporting income and expenses to the IRS. And I don't know the numbers on whether that's worse or better than it used to be. But, you know, there's always been an issue around that. And the IRS is, you know, supposed to look into it. Uh, in this case, presumably when they do, if they do, uh, when the newspapers do, or, um, or maybe there's a sort of nexus between what uh, Letitia James is doing and uh, what's on those tax returns, uh, it's likely we're going to find out that the same overvaluation and undervaluation MO that he was using, you know, uh, in the case that she has pending against him uh, was being used in those tax returns. I think a number of them relate to the same years that she's covering. Uh, so I, I agree with Cynthia that, um, you know, you can't believe anything in, from him at all. He's pathological. And these returns reflected that. It's really odd that the income and expenses would have been the same, um, you know, right down to the dollar. And I, and I add something that we always knew. There are three kinds of people on Wall Street. There's the bulls, there's the bears, and there's the pigs. And what you don't want to be is a pig. And to have the income and expenses net out at exactly the same dollars, that's being a pig. And that's what he was doing for his entire professional life. Good point. So, okay, so we have the Supreme Court making a decision that they're to be released. Does that now become case law as a basis for every president's tax returns to be released to Ways and Means Committee and, and ultimately to the public? Is that, is that is a good thing or, um, or, or does Donald Trump have a point, Jay? No, he doesn't have a point. They have okay. been for the last several presidents released. And it's only fair that the American people who, you know, who have voted and therefore adopted this, this person, this president, any president, as, a, as the father of our country, we have to know about him. We have to be sure, um, you know, that he's been vetted. We want to know during his campaign, not afterward, not years afterward. And I might add, I know you want to talk about George Santos also, that it would have been really effective if we had seen George Santos's tax returns. Uh, I mean, I would ascribe to the notion that everybody running for political office has to be transparent about his, his sure. business activities, especially now in a world where you can not only be compromised, um, you know, by players and actors in the country, but by players and actors outside the country. And I think that's a great concern in the investigation of those bank accounts overseas, Trump's bank accounts. So Great I think point. every everybody running for office has to be transparent, and they Absolutely. should all turn over their tax returns. Great point. Uh, last question on this topic, uh, Cynthia, to you: um, Is it? Is, do you agree with Jay that it is proper and right to uh, release tax returns of a presidential candidate or president of the United States to the general public, uh, either before election or during during uh, holding the office? I absolutely agree with that. I think it is paramount for us to understand what kind of, especially in this case with the foreign bank accounts, China, right? Is that's just big. At the same time that his daughter was getting all those, you know, uh, uh, what you call it? That um, I'm a mental block against that word right now, but um, emoluments. All the Thank you, all the patents. Thank you. Um, <laughs> at the same time, right? That this is happening. He's got this secret bank account at the same time that the Republicans are standing up saying that Joe Biden 
is in bed with the Chinese financially, we find out that it's Trump that's in bed with the Chinese financially. And so these are things that we should know from Biden or Trump or anyone else that is ever going to hold public office, including Congress, because think about all the senators that came in and they make, what, 200000 a year? And they're billionaires now. Mm-hmm. And of course, they blame it on their spouses, but they don't have to tell us what's going on. We don't get to find out about how inappropriate they are with stock information and insider trading and all these other things that the ethics committee could investigate. But if it gets gutted, then we won't know. And I think it's imperative for public to know. You know, the last question, because the last one wasn't my last question. uh, (laughs) If there is evidence of tax evasion, will the IRS follow up on it and do something about it? Well, not if it's corrupted like we've been talking about it. Well, well, Trump's not in office now. He's not in office. And and to the extent that it that might have been a corruption certainly would be embarrassing to the IRS. But really, the IRS has the mechanisms to report all that through the Department of Justice. Think Al Capone. And the Department of Justice could prosecute. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think there's a real barrier to that as presently exists. It's just that somebody has to get in there, roll up his sleeves, and look at those returns. Yeah. And, well, and, they, uh, they, part, they claim you know, that the tax is so complicated that the IRS doesn't have the personnel to actually understand and audit it. Now, isn't that crazy? Well, I think that's a budget question. And I think that, uh, I, I don't recall exactly, but at some point in Trump's uh, administration, he was cutting the, the budget to the IRS and therefore mm-hmm. making it harder for them to have the resources necessary to audit his returns. And, yeah. and a lot of the returns are the one percenters. Right. Okay. Hey, let's, we're almost out of time. So let's move on to the next topic because this certainly has caught my attention. And I, I scratch my head every time I see an update on um, uh, Representative-elect George Santos from New York. My God, Uh, Cynthia, he's lied about his jobs. He's lied about his education. He's lied about his heritage, um, saying he's Jewish, but not Jewish, but Jewish. My God, what what more or how much more can he lie? Uh, And did he wamboozle the voting public of, of, of his district? Your thoughts about him soon to be, or depends on who the Speaker of the House is in the House of Representatives, but what's your opinion about this guy being seated as a representative of Congress? Cynthia. Well, well, I can't imagine that it could happen except for that the Republicans want his vote so bad and they want that you know bigger majority so bad that they're not going to do anything to hold him accountable. So, but I would think if they had known this one piece of information before the election, he never would have won. And that is the fact that he said his mother died on 9-11. And New Yorkers are pretty protective over that, all of the information and facts. So what, what happened to candidate research before you, you throw your hat in the ring? What happened to those, uh, those things that normally do take place? Well, there's so much misinformation out there and there's so many people that are getting their information from just random Internet sources that it's hard to know. And they may have heard it, but it was, you know, on this side, it had so much other stuff that they weren't sure which one to pick. Right. So now that it's all coming out as, you know, we know for sure he lied. It's a different story. But um, I think it's too bad. And I think it's partly on uh, on the backs of the media for not doing their due diligence to find out and to voters for not doing their due diligence to find right. out. And what about you know, the other representatives in New York? Why weren't they doing it? So it's like a long chain of, of mishaps and misinformation that I think is the problem behind so much of this stuff that's going yeah. on. You know, Cynthia, we just had a midterm election and a lot of the, the election deniers were not elected as a direct result of voters saying, we've had enough of some of this. We just want people to do their job and do them right. Um, so if they seat George Santos in this position, how much more does that stain 
the existing GOP party as far as uh, bringing in these deplorable candidates. And <laughs> quite frankly, George Santos is deplorable. Oh, yes. So <laughs> how does that stain or does it matter anymore that there's yet another, you know, huge stain on, on their namesake? There is a huge stain on their namesake. And I think it's just sort of a, a nameplate for all of them. George Santos being a complete liar who will manipulate the truth to suit himself and to suit his own desires. And how often do we see that with the Republican Party anyway? When yeah. you think about Kevin McCarthy not being able to get to the votes for speaker, and he's one of the big election deniers himself. So, and, and we know Santos is an election denier. And we know that there's a quorum of 20, or not a quorum, but a, a group of 20 other Republicans that aren't willing to come over to the Freedom Caucus that aren't willing to come over and vote for him. So um, we know there's so much upheaval happening in the Republican Party. They are just in complete chaos. And I think he's just a, you know, a good stamp point to put in the front of all of it. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Hey, Jay, you know, New York is not the backwaters of the United States. There's a lot of savvy voters, a lot of savvy media. Um, how did this happen in New York? That a candidate like this um, you know, made it through <laughs> all the checks and balances and actually was uh, elected as House representative? You know, this is more than one pathological individual who likes to tell stories. It's, it's more than the one candidate. It is emblematic of a broken system. And when I say system, I, I point at, uh, you know, the people, um, you know, that, that Cynthia was talking about and everyone involved in the election. It could have happened in Nebraska just as well. Um, OK, the voters did not do their due diligence. The media did not do its due diligence. Uh, and, and that's really sad because they probably could have found the stuff out before that they found out after. You know, there was no reason why, if they, if they had looked at it before, they, they couldn't find out what they found out after. Um, and, and of course, uh, what about the opponent? He, he wasn't running in a vacuum. Somebody could have said something. Uh, the Democratic Party could have said something. And what was this? And, and of all that money, how did that money get to him? I mean, yeah. these are all, you know, these are all um, indications that the voting system. You know, aside from all, you know, the um, you know, the voting suppression that we see in the red states uh, and, you know, the business with the electoral college that we saw in several states and, you know, the Republican shenanigans. Aside from that, this is not that. This is just lying to the public and selling snake oil and everybody is buying it. Um, if we are going to have democratic elections, this cannot happen. It can't happen with Santos or, Santos or anyone else. We should not well, let them lie. We should do our okay. due diligence. We should require the press to do its due diligence. Um, and of course, we, we also need to have a mechanism to throw him out of Congress, which we don't Correct. have. Right. Okay, well, you know, the standard bearer of someone who has a real trouble uh, communicating reality and truth is our former president. Uh, did he become the standard bearer or the the, the guiding light for candidates like Santos to not worry about their past and say, ah, if Donald Trump could be a, a, a compulsive, habitual a liar, so can I. Is that the new standard? But, and well, that's how he got elected. The standard with Trump all along. He, Trump lies, and, and the message he sends is that it's okay to lie. It's just politics, not under oath. They'll never catch you. You know, it's catch me if you can kind of thing. That's what he did in his real estate business. Uh, that's what he did with the media, you know, through his life. And uh, that you know, certainly that's what he encourages here. And, you know, he endorsed the guy. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm very concerned about about how this worked out. And, um, I, you know, I think it's this is Trump's fault. If I didn't mention him on my list of horribles, um, Trump endorsed him. Trump put him out. Uh, certainly there were people out there in that district who were Trumpers who voted for the guy because Trump had endorsed him. Um, so, you know, this is really bloody awful. 
Uh, and I don't think people get it yet. This could happen again, ladies. Well, it can, Jay, and I think that's a great point. I guess I'm still perplexed as to how it happened in the first place. How a candidate this flawed and this compulsive lying uh, trail that he's laid, uh, um, how that wasn't passed out and, um, and exposed. And yet it did happen. And I don't think we've heard a reasonable explanation as to how it did happen. Either of you on that point. Well, I think the system is broken. I mean, you have secret money coming in. Nobody knows where it came from. You have a guy who lied. You have people who don't do diligence, and they vote for somebody they, you know, they don't know anything about. Um, so I mean, the system is broken, and and you know, this is one of those layered things that Trump did to pervert democracy. This is an attack on democracy, not only in what happened in the election and the run-up, the campaign and the election, but what is happening right now. He yeah. should not be permitted to hold office, and yet he is. Well, and, and that's a great point. And Cynthia, I know that a local newspaper in Long Island did pick this up, picked up a lot of the inaccuracies of his resume, and it was reported. Yet that newspaper didn't get to the bigger news agencies. And so the story died a natural death of not enough readers and not enough uh, uh, spotlights on it. Your thought on that? Well, and know, where was social media, where we expect, you know, is an, an open book on everything. Social media is missing in action on this one. Where are they? That's what I said, too. Where are the media and aren't they behind so much of this? But not just that. There has been a full on attack against truth. It has been devolved into alternative facts and and so often we were told during the Trump administration that everybody lies, all politicians lie. So now suddenly lying is the norm. So it's been established that lying is a norm. That you know, it's been established that that truth doesn't matter because there's always. Okay, that's my point. Is 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 the George Santos an anomaly, or is this of things to come? I think it is a, a standard bearer of things to come until we can start reestablishing the difference between truth and alternative facts. There's either facts or there's lies. There's truth or there's lies. There can't be some. OK, but I, I, I'm seeing comments of disgust, not only from Democrats, but also from uh, fellow Republicans. I mean, my God, he was a pariah yesterday. If you saw him on the news and there's been reports that even his GOP, even his New York GOP brethren, um, avoided him as if he was the plague himself. Right. Uh, so there is some pushback on this. Um, your thought on the pushback? Bottom line is he's, he's still in office. That's the bottom line. Does he stay in office? We'll see. Cynthia, does he stay in office? We'll uh, see. I we'll don't see. We so. don't know yet. But we don't know. We're, if we have to count on the Republicans to do it, no, I have a great little quote from uh, Jennifer Rubin here. <laughs> Seriously, asking Republicans to exercise personal restraint is like asking a tiger to go vegan. <laughs> so, great. so that's, you know, you I know, mean, you know, we posted a, a link to a, a frontline lies, uh, truth and ignorance and democracy on, on frontline, which is um, on PBS and uh, also on YouTube. And uh, it's an interview of a woman named, uh, it was a really incredible woman named uh, Mona Charan, uh, who was in the Reagan White House. She's a conservative, in fact, a Republican. And uh, what she said was the Republican Party had changed completely, um, that, that, that they you know, did no longer believed in the truth or in democracy, and that uh, until they shape up, and they may never shape up, uh, we can never support them again. That's not an exact quote, but that is the essence of her interview remarks. We can never support them again. And, and as, as you say, they're, they're not going to throw Santos out. Um, they're, they're not going to have a, a reasonable period in this uh, Congress, uh, reasonable policy, reasonable conversations. Um, and we can never support them again. They're done as far as millions and millions of people are concerned. All righty. Hey, we've run out of time, but I want to go ask both of you your, your last thoughts, either about the George Santos uh, placement or the IRS audit story. 
Uh, Cynthia, with you. I have one last uh, quote that came out of uh, Jennifer Rubin's last uh, article that I read. And it says, when the inquisitors exempt themselves from ethical restraints, they send the message that rules are only for Democrats. Democrats, in turn, will send the message in 2024 that it's time to return to honest, competent governance. So all this uh machinations and uh and trouble and chaos that's going on with the removal of the ethics committee and all of these other things could come back to bite them because there's even republicans they don't want all this chaos either some do but the majority of them don't so it's time for the reasonable republicans and you've heard me say this a million times to come back to reality so that we can get back to competent, honest governance. Well stated. Thank you, Cynthia. Jay, your last thoughts. I'm not optimistic about that. Um, there is no leadership in the Republican Party that's going to return it to what it was. And uh, Jennifer Rubin was right. And um, uh, Mona Charon was right. And uh, I, don't, I don't have any high expectations. Um, the other thing I want to point out in my, my final comment is that what we are seeing now is the legacy of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. He did more damage than we ever understood. We on this program and we in the country, we never knew how corrosive, how damaging, how destructive his moves were. Not only the visible ones, but the invisible ones. And they will... They form his legacy. They will last for a long time. The damage he, the damage he did to the country and our democracy and our government and our relations overseas, it will will continue for a long time, and it may actually be historically permanent for us. Thank you, Donald Trump. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, what scares me about your comment is you speak to the audience as if this was past tense. He is a current candidate for the 2024 20, president of the United States position. Um, so again, vigilance is uh, required from, from you, me, Cynthia, and everyone that uh, is in the media business and every voter that votes. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And we better start being more vigilant than we've been. Great. Great way to end. Great note to end on. Thank you very much, my co-host, Jay Fidel and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. I want to thank everyone for tuning in this show, uh, American One, American Issues Take One. I wish everyone a prosperous and healthy 2023. I'm Tim Apichel, your host. Join us next week. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.